Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church. Glad that you are here with us on this dark and stormy Sunday morning. So <laughs> it was more foreboding at first service, so that joke landed a lot better. <laughs> Much better than that one even, too. So <laughs> glad you all are here. Let us know that you're here with us. You can find your connection cards that are part of your bulletin. Fill those out and drop them in the offering plate on your way out today. Those of you that are online with us, give us a shout out. Let us know that uh, you were out there with us here. So, uh, a few announcements uh, later on this uh, this week, Thursday morning, always the first Thursday of May, is always the National Day of Prayer. And so this year, the Stowe Monroe Falls Ministerial Association will once again uh, be observing the National Day of Prayer. This time we're going to be doing it at 8 a.m. up at City Hall, outside City Hall at the uh, flagpole. Uh, we're going to do this from 8, and the prayers are meant to be just a, you know, a short succession of a few uh, uh, prayers with uh, certain focuses. Uh, and then that time of prayer will last uh, just about 20 minutes or so so that uh, those that are maybe making their way uh, to work can come out and be a part of that time of prayer uh, and then uh, move on with the rest of their day. If you are able, you're welcome to linger for a little bit afterwards. We'll have some coffee and some light refreshments, uh, but that is coming up this Thursday, May 5th, 8 a.m. up at Stowe City Hall. Uh, we continue to uh, collect for Stowe Bulldog bags. Um, we are collecting uh, individual cups of macaroni and cheese for the next uh, week or so. Uh, take note that next Sunday, uh, it is Mother's Day, so uh, uh, keep that in mind. But also next Sunday is going to be our Youth Sunday. We're going to have a number of our youth participating in worship next Sunday, helping to lead uh, various parts of, uh, of worship. And so our youth are getting ready for that, and they are meeting today after worship uh, to continue that work. So we're looking forward to um, to Youth Sunday coming up next week. Uh, there are a few other things uh, going on in life for the church. We invite you to check it out in your bulletin and then look for uh, the May issue of the Pathways newsletter that should be on newsstands by Tuesday is our, our hope. That will hopefully be in your email inbox. Among them is uh, um, information about registration uh, to go to Camp Christian this summer. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, you can check that out online or talk to me and how you can uh, get uh, one of your youth, or maybe even yourself, to Camp Christian. They're always looking for counselors. Uh, so if you uh, have an interest in that, let us know. Uh, but uh, more information about all that's coming up in the Life Church is in your bulletin and on the, uh, in the upcoming Pathways. Our text for the, today it comes from uh, the book of Ezekiel, and we'll get to uh, that entire text a little bit later, but I wanted to share this from our text for today uh, to lead us into worship when God is talking to Ezekiel, and God says, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And will act. Those words, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. God's spirit is always around us. God's spirit is always there for us to take in. God's spirit is here with us now. So let us open ourselves up to God's spirit. Let us be reminded of how God's spirit has been put into us, and because of that Spirit, we have been made able to live. And certainly that is worth our praise and our worship. So let us be open to that Spirit and let us offer that praise and that worship. And let us do so now as we continue in this time of worship, as we stand, as you're able, and join together in singing our opening hymn, number 97, Ferris Lord Jesus. Let us sing.
happy May. It looks like our fourth or fifth winter might finally be over. <laughs> so maybe you'll see an early summer before we really settle into spring. I even see people venturing out into their yards and their gardens, their flower beds, and they're planning for an abundant gardening season. Some people even tell me that that brings them joy, putting on their gardening gear, digging in the dirt, and creating beauty and new life or roughly 2,000 cherry tomatoes, since they can survive anything. <laughs> but I am not those people. I, I don't judge them, but I don't join them. I am thankful this Sunday for this time and this space with all of you. I am thankful for God, who is the source of all lasting life. I hope that when we hear God's call to follow him today, we will be filled and renewed with energy and purpose. Please join me in prayer. Lord, your call is the life we are searching for. You give us all that we need that to nourish and grow in this beautiful garden of our earthly life and in everlasting life with you beyond. Help us to receive your spirit today so that we can carry your love out into the world. Amen. I was, am I doing this right? <laughs> okay, just checking. I gotta read the room. <laughs> I was saddened yesterday to hear of the passing of Naomi Judd. Naomi and her daughter, Winona, were known as the music duo, the Judds, and they greatly inspired my love of country music in 1990 with their song, Love Can Build a Bridge. I was in junior high, and that was a very emotional time for me as a tween, but it's also a really beautiful song. Naomi Judd was born Diana Ellen Judd on January 11, 1946. She was an honor roll student and she often played piano in the Baptist church her family attended, but shocked the town by getting pregnant at age 17. She married a different sweetheart and she missed her high school graduation giving birth to her daughter, Winona, who was born Christina, May 30, 1964. Naomi and Winona endured years of challenges and poverty. They caught their first big break through Naomi's nursing job one of her patients happened to be the daughter of a record producer, and that contact led to an audition for RCA executives in early 1983. The Judds were signed on the spot and issued their debut single, Had a Dream, later that year. Today, the Judds were set to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, and just 19 days ago, the mother-daughter duo announced their farewell tour. Naomi Judd died at the age of 76. She is survived by her husband of 32 years, her two adult daughters, and her grandchildren. We never know the struggles that each of us is going through today. Please extend a sign of peace to each other as you are comfortable. I already started doubting myself. I spooked myself.
our children for for our children's message choir thank you so much what a, what a beautiful song thanks chuck <coughs> all right come on down <coughs> how's, it, how's it going everybody's doing all right all right i think we got it all right Okay, all right, so check it out. I have a balloon with me. God, come on down, right? Balloons are pretty great, right? You can bounce them around, right? Hang them up for decorations, play games with them. But we definitely don't fill them with water and throw them at our siblings. No, we don't do that, <laughs> right? So, but mine's not working so good right not much of a decoration not very fun to play with right why is that 
Yeah. I didn't put in here. I always forget to do that, right? I got to put some air in it, right? It needs to be blown up, right? So we have to do what to get the air in it? Put air in it. Put air in it. How do I do that? I blow it into it, huh? Hey, look at that. Wow, now the party started, right? I can really tell by your faces that you guys are so excited by this. <laughs> right? Right? Well, balloons are a lot. Thank you, Violet. I appreciate that. My daughter, yeah. All <laughs> right. Balloons are a lot more fun when they have air in them, right? You can do all kinds of things. Like I said, they can become decorations, right? And then you can do things like this. That's what everybody out there is thinking. It's like, that's what I hear every time he preaches. That's so weird. <laughs> right? Or what happens when, when, we, when we don't tie them off? Whoa! <laughs> there it went. That's crazy, right? An inflated balloon. <laughs> An inflated balloon, a balloon with air in it that we've breathed into, right? They make things happen, right? Without the air, without the breath in it, nothing happens, right? It's just, you know, boring, lifeless, isn't it? Well, did you know the same thing is kind of true with us? We need to have breath in us to move. We need breath in us to, to well, to party and to fly around and do the things that we like to do, right? But who puts breath into us? Who does that? My preacher just asked you a question. Jesus, Jesus or God. Good one, right? In this case, we're going to talk about God, right? Because right? we're talking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's a prophet by the name of Ezekiel who was with God, and God showed Ezekiel a whole bunch of lifeless, breathless bones. And God said to the bones, O dry bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. All right? So take a deep breath. Let it out. All right? Take a deep breath. Let it out. All right? God gives us breath so that we can enjoy life and have fun, right? Take a deep breath. Let it out. God gives us breath so that we can speak truth, so that we can sing praises, just like our choir did to God, right? We take a deep breath. We let it out. God gives us breath so that we can use our bodies to run and to play and to help others, right? Take a deep breath. We let it out. God gives us breath so that we can blow up our balloon, which we can then use to remember how God is present with us always. Every time we blow up a balloon, we see how God has given us breath. And because God has given us breath, the air that we have gives us life. Every breath we take is because God puts it there for us. And God wants us to use every breath to give praise to God, to help others know of God's breath, and for others to know that life comes from God. And when we take our breath from God, well, that's when we find the good life. A life that's filled. A life that's not deflated, but a life that is filled with God's goodness. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for every breath we take and every move we make. Help us to remember all life comes from you. Amen. So, I don't know if I'll get a consensus, but I have a question for everyone. It's very serious. What do you call the last piece in a loaf of bread? Some might call it the heel. Maybe they call it just the end or the rump. And why do we give that piece of bread such a bad reputation? <laughs> it's made from the same ingredients as the rest of the loaf, but it has this humble job of shoring up the ends of the loaf against the hot pan. 
we judge the heel for being different after all it's done for us. <laughs> are we relegating the heel of our loaf for God in our church, or are we giving him the, the soft, delicious pieces in the middle? I say, I'll ruin the surprise, God just wants us to share the loaf. That's it. He wants us to share it in whatever way we can, no matter what condition the slice we have to offer. When we share our bounty, it's not just with God, but with everyone around us through our church ministries, our daily life, and through our love shown to others. Always leave space for God. Our tithing is like that. Our tithe is giving room for God to move. It opens up possibilities for God to bless us. You can make your offers of gifts electronically by mail to the church office and here in the church in the offering baskets as you leave church today. Thank you. Please bless our gifts as well as the giver. We pray that this offering goes to those who need it the most. In your precious name we pray, amen. You may be seated. For those, of, for those of you that were finding themselves following the children's message, prayer, humming, a little ditty from Sting and the police, well, what's life without a little whimsy? <laughs> if you don't know what, what I mean by that, go back and watch the tape. Uh, yeah, it's, ask a Gen Xer that's here. Right? Yeah. So, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I'll be watching you, Ricky. <laughs> God's word for us today comes, as I mentioned, from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. I hope this text sounds familiar. And you'll understand why in a few moments. But Ezekiel tells us, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and the Lord brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. The Lord led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. 
I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to these, to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then the Lord said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, so my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can these bones live? God asks this in the middle of a valley, a narrow space filled with a vast vast expanse of dry bones. The land is lifeless, barren, no breath, dead. Can these bones live? God asks this of Ezekiel, a prophet of Israel after the Babylonians have scorched the earth, sacked Jerusalem, and kidnapped the best and the brightest from among the nation of Israel. A nation given life at Mount Sinai now lay dead in a valley. Can these bones live? God asks this just before one of the greatest reversal narratives of the Bible. Ezekiel's visionary vista of desolation and destruction undergoes an astonishing transfiguration of the jumbled, lifeless bones as they begin to rattle and move to where they are knit together, take on flesh, and finally come to life, all as a sign of the future revival of the Jewish people held captive in Babylon. Can these bones live? God asks this to Ezekiel, who then responds saying, Oh Lord, you know. To which God says, Yeah, I do know. But do you? Can these bones live? God asks this just before casting a vision to Ezekiel and Israel of breath and life entering where death had been. Can these bones live? God is asking us this question today. And will be asking us this question for the months to come. Do we know the answer? Do we even want to? A lot of this might sound familiar, as it was actually just over two years ago in March of 2020, the first Sunday of Lent, when I last preached from this text. I preached this text and that sermon on the first Sunday of Lent because Lent is a season that, like this text, paints an incredibly distinct picture of barrenness, lifelessness and death, all culminating when breath is put back into that which was dead. All of this was the start of the 2020 Lenten season, during which we as a church were going to intentionally examine a spiritual imperative, as I called it then. 
Now here's where I'm going to do something I've never, ever done in a sermon before. At least not like this. I've quoted countless wise and scholarly people in my sermons over the years, but I have never, for obvious reasons, quoted myself. Some of you laughed a little too hard at that. (laughs) It's weird to quote myself, and it feels incredibly haughty and ostentatious, but hopefully before too long you'll see why I'm doing this. So, in March of 2020, on the first Sunday of Lent, in a sermon entitled Recreate, the incredibly wise and scholarly Reverend Jonathan Rumbrick, see it got weird right there, yeah, see (laughs) I said ostentatious, I meant obnoxious, actually. But seriously, on March 1st was the day, March 1st, 2020, first Sunday of Lent, in a sermon entitled Recreate, and talking about the text for that day and the text for this day, I said, Lent is a season that takes us us to an Easter celebration. But before we get to that celebration, there is an imperative we are first called to address. And that imperative imperative is the state of our spirit. In the season of Lent, we are led to look at our surroundings, to truly look at where we are in this life, and discern if it is spiritually good. We are led to look for where the boneyards are around us, be it in our hearts, family, church, or community. We are led to consider what God's prophecy to recreate, to breathe new life into us, looks like. We are led to ask the question, can these bones live? Can life come into death? And then listen for God's resounding yes. All this was to set up and lead us into what was coming to us as a church in the following months. A time of spiritual renewal. Also known as my sabbatical from the church and all sabbatical from me. Spiritual renewal. Recreate. Sabbatical. All of it with the intent to now quote the Indianapolis-based Lilly Foundation who awarded our church the grant, with the intent of strengthening relationships, renewing a sense of call, meeting and serving the neighbor in a new way, finding joy and purpose in a simplified life, traveling to new lands and unfamiliar territories. There's also a time for creating opportunities where members of the congregation can exercise their gifts for ministry. Within it all, there become opportunities for profound discoveries that pastors and their congregations describe as life-changing events. March 1st, 2020. I preached that sermon and talked all about this renewal and recreating time coming that summer. What it was going to be and most importantly what it would do to put new breath into my ministry and into your ministry. While casting a vision of where God would have us go, be, and do as a church. Three weeks later... The vision I had was preaching to an empty sanctuary. And the vision you had was worshiping via a device. Or maybe you didn't worship at all because you didn't have a device. All of it then and all that followed made it incredibly hard to hear God's resounding yes to the question, can these bones live? And if we're honest, then and today, our answer to can these bones live might just be a resounding no. Just like the words from Ezekiel paint an incredibly distinct picture, 
So do the words 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, masks, hand washing, hand sanitizer, infected, tested positive, vaccinated, boosted, unvaccinated, anti-vaxxer, anti-mask, Zoom meetings, homeschool, work from home, online worship. We can think of even more words. These words paint an incredibly distinct picture we could not see in March of 2020. At least not on March 1st. A picture we are trying hard to forget here in 2022 because our answer to the question, can these bones live, is not Ezekiel's, oh Lord, you know. It's more like, oh Lord, I don't want to talk about it. And why don't we want to talk about it? Might it be because we don't want to have to tell God what we really think? Might it be because we don't believe God will? We know God can. We just don't think God will. Like children who have been asked by their parents, do you understand me? We give the answer we know we're supposed to give, but yet deep within us we believe something different. Like Israel lost in the wilderness wandering, like Israel scorched and sacked by an overpowering force, like disciples bewildered and terrified on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, like children who don't know why but just what is. We hear the question, can these bones live? And we answer, oh Lord, you know, but we don't anymore. We used to know, but now everything has changed, and we don't know how life could be any other way than the way it is now. So, no, we aren't so sure that these bones can live. Not because we think you can't, but because we've started to believe we can't. That's the new, incredibly distinct picture that has been painted in our mind's eye. For more than two years, we have seen the scorched barrenness and lifelessness creep across our world, physically and spiritually. We have seen the divisions, the brokenness, the reprioritization. We have felt it in our bones, now dried up. We cried tears, but they too are all dried up. We've settled into this new normal where The words paint an incredibly distinct picture for sure, but if we are not careful, will paint us into a corner of judgment and brokenness. And that's why we don't want to talk about the question, can these bones live? Better to just not ask. Here's the thing question has to be asked, and we have to answer it, because if it's not, if it's not asked, if it's not answered, then why are we even here? Can these bones live? That was the question lingering in the mind and heart of artist Cody F. Miller, when he created this piece called Ezekiel in the Valley of Bones. And when we look at this piece, the answer to this question posed to the prophet seems painfully obvious in such a macabre setting depicted in this mixed media collage by Miller. And the obvious answer is that in a place of skulls heaped upon skulls, no, these bones can't live. But when we go deeper into the piece, we see how Miller builds up his composition from drawings and patterns made from magazine clippings and depicts the moment of divine empowerment coming with wind and fire like the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And in a pose that, quote, plays off the graveyard soliloquy scene in Shakespeare's Hamlet, 
According to an actual wise scholar and writer for the Christian century, John Cohen, who then further says, the prophet delivers God's call to new life to just one of the many dead in this carnal heap, suggesting that collective renewal begins with transformed individuals. Collective renewal begins with transformed individuals. Miller tells about his art and specifically this piece when he says, my pieces are about hope. Not, necessar Not necessarily in a bright way, <laughs> but in a way that reveals the hidden fingerprint of God, letting us know I have been here all along. It's that truth, yoked with God's vision of a future revival that can help us find reason and energy and hope to answer this question we don't want to talk about. Maybe you're as tired of hearing about this sabbatical as much as I am. <laughs> but I actually doubt it. This whole effort has been languishing since early 2019. And I don't intend to speak disparagingly of this or sound ungrateful. It's just that it's been a long and difficult road to traverse. And now with it just three weeks away, I have to admit, things have changed to the point that like the initial viewing of this piece, the answer to the question, can these bones live, seems to be no. Which is why this text, this question from God to Ezekiel, this perceived picture of what is juxtaposed with what God knows. This idea that the same spirit that put flesh upon dry bones and breathed into lifelessness is the same spirit that surrounds us when we choose to perceive it. This idea that even the most beaten down of people can rise up by God's word. This idea that in our doubt about God, God says, I have been here all along. Well, it can all lead a person to change their perspective, their doubt, their belief, their priorities, their vision of an incredibly distinct picture. We know the answer to God's question, can these bones live? Ezekiel tells us that. Oh God, you know. But what is our answer to God's question. What is our answer to God's question? Can these bones live? Do we know? Do we even want to know? Do we see a sign of future revival? Or do we just see what is and what we think will always be? Can these bones live? This question is no longer a question of God, for God has already answered it. This question is now a question for us. How will we answer it? Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, we know the answer to your question. We know you are able, that you can, that you have and will again breathe new life into lifelessness and bring forth a revival of transformation. We know you are here with us, telling us again these bones can live, that what was dead can be given new life. We know you are still at work, and your work is always for good. We know what you are able to do, for we were reminded again of your almighty power that you can overcome death. Reminded of such just a couple of weeks ago when we shouted, he is risen, risen indeed. We know, Lord, but do we believe? We know, Lord, but do we live? We know, Lord, but do we trust you will again?
this time in us and this world where so often all we can see are the dry, lifeless bones all around us, among them our own. We know, Lord, what you can do. But apathy, listlessness, bitterness, division, judgment, busyness, disdain for some, tribalness with others, they keep us from seeing only a distinct picture that does not include your ways or your plans or your work. So we pray, Holy God, make us ready for the new breath you bring. Make us ready to make authentic change happen in our lives by guiding us to live authentically Christ-like lives. Just as in Ezekiel's prophecy for Israel, where there was a deep, deep need for recreation, we admit our need for deep restoration. But we must be reminded again and again that such restoration has to be accompanied by your openness, by our openness to do your will and to see differently the vision cast before us. So cause your breath to enter our dry bones that we might be recreated into the church you call us to be in a world that turns away from you but is in desperate need of all the life you have to give. Here now we ask the prayers of our hearts as we offer them in this time of holy silence. All this we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us gather together around our Lord's table, and let us do so as we sing together our communion hymn as it's found in your chalice of praise. Can these bones live? 
It is a question that is an imperative to be asked. Imperative to be asked by God to us and by us to ourselves. It's an imperative to ask as we come to this table where we are reminded that here at this table, Christ's body broken, his blood spilled, that he did find that breath again. That by God's almighty power, he was raised from the dead. Every time we come to this table, we are reminded of God saying to us, I have been here always. I've been here with you through it all. And yes, these bones can live again. When we come to this table, we are invited to hear this question. We are here invited to hear God's resounding yes. And in these elements of bread and cup, they empower us to respond to that question with a resounding yes of our own. So let all come to this table. Let them come just as they are with their own hard questions. And let them begin to find answers and responses from God our Creator and Christ Jesus our Savior. For it was on that night... Before Jesus was crucified, he gathered with his disciples to share with them a meal. And during that meal, he took a loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat of this, all of you. For this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, Jesus took a cup and he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup represents my shed blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it, and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, let us come to this table. Receive its gifts. For these are the gifts of God, for the people of God. Please join me in prayer. We come to this table today because of God's grace and everlasting love. As we break bread together, unite us as people who are grateful for this renewal journey, for each other's company along our path, and for God's never-ending guiding presence. In your precious name we pray, amen. God is always 
calling to us, inviting us to consider a deeper presence of God. And God does that in a variety of ways, asking us questions like, mortal, can these bones live? God's presence surrounds us always, filling our spirits, inviting us to draw closer. And so let us all consider that invitation And let us consider how we will respond to that invitation. Perhaps it will be with a reaffirmation of faith. Let us consider how it is that we will respond. And let us do so as we stand, as you're able, and join together in singing the first two verses of hymn number 558. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Let us sing. For a moment, I want to introduce you to some folks that many of you probably know. You've been seeing them around the church for a while. Uh, this is uh, Janice and Kurt Carlton, and then Holly and Sean Laser. This is Holly's parents, and then of course this is the lovely Ava, their daughter, and granddaughter. Ava's in the fourth grade here in uh, in Stowe. And they've been a part of the church for, for a while now. We've had some conversations, yep, yeah, for over a year. And uh, they uh, have been coming here and, and been led to, to make this their, their church home. And uh, we rejoice and give thanks that, uh, that they have heard God's call and direction in, uh, in doing that. And today they want to make that official. You guys have been a part of the church for already, but... Now you make it official. And so, uh, so I want to ask all of you a, a question. Kurt, I'll start with you. And so I just want to ask you in the presence of this congregation, in the presence of God, Kurt, do you still believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, and do you still take him as your Lord and your Savior? If so, please answer, I do. I do. I know you do. God bless you. And Janice, I ask you in the presence of this congregation, in the presence of God, do you still believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, Do you still take him as your Lord and Savior? If so, please answer, I do. do. May God bless you in this reaffirmation. I'll talk to you more in a second. (laughs) Holly, I want to ask you in the presence of this congregation, in the presence of God, do you still believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God? Do you still take him as your Lord and your Savior? If so, please answer, I do. God bless you in this reaffirmation. And Sean, I ask you in the presence of this congregation, in the presence of God, do you still believe Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God? And do you still take him as your Lord and your Savior? If so, please answer, I do. I do. 
And God bless you in this reaffirmation. And Ava, I know that you have been a part of this church and, and church before for a long time. And I know your heart and your faith. I know that you are growing in faith in Christ Jesus too. And in, you're in the fourth grade. And here at First Christian, when we get to the fifth grade, I see one of my students over there. Um, we go through what we call a pastor's class. And you're going to get to do that. You're going to get to do that with your buddy Violet over there. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, you have to do it with me as well. So, uh, but it'll be painless. And then uh, we'll work towards you making that same uh, reaffirmation of faith as well. And so we're so glad that you are part of this and part of this very special day in the life of your family. And this very special day in the life of First Christian Church of Stowe. God bless you in this reaffirmation and in this next step. And may God bless you in the ministries that you will be a part of and the ministries that you will do and bring to this church and to our community and far, far beyond. Thank you. God bless you. Friends, let's stand for our benediction. <clears throat> Just as this family has heard and been guided by God's call and direction, each of us is guided and called by God as well. How will we respond? How will we begin to answer that question for ourselves? Mortal, can these bones live? Because they can. They most certainly can. The Spirit of God is always around us showing us how they can. It's up to us to how we will respond. So let us go forth ready to respond in faithfulness, ready to respond with a resounding yes, because there are too many who we will cross paths with who answer that question with a resounding no. And they need a voice and a presence that can help them hear that resounding yes. And when they do hear it from us, and maybe they want to hear more. Maybe it's then that we offer them the invitation, the opportunity for them to come and begin to find that transformation, that new life, that new breath for themselves. Maybe right here on a Sunday morning. So as you go forth to share that good news, to share that breath, to share that resounding yes, may the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ rest and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.